Hey guys, it's Miss Navard again, just checking in and we're going to continue doing our read aloud of Holes by Lewis Satchar. I'm going to go over the questions that we had first from chapters 5 to 7. So the first question that I asked you is, who is Stanley's counselor? His name was Mr. Pendansky. He is the person who is in charge of taking care of Stanley while he's at Camp Green Lake. Um, the second question I asked is, whose shoes did Stanley take? He took Clyde Livingston's shoes. He's a famous baseball player in the story, and he was going to donate them to a homeless shelter, but um, somehow that didn't happen, and somehow Stanley wound up with them, and that's why he was sent to Camp Green Lake, because they thought that he stole the shoes from that homeless shelter. So that's who he stole the shoes from was Clyde Livingston, and they were worth $5,000. That's why it was such a big deal. Okay, um... What do they measure their holes with as they dig? Their their shovel, the width of their, their length of their shovel is the how they measure their holes when they dig them. They have to be five feet deep and five feet across in every single direction. So that's a really big hole. That's like my height. That's crazy. Okay. Um, what is Stanley's great-grandfather's name? So Stanley, his great-grandfather's name was Elia. Elia, okay, and then his son was the first Stanley, okay, so great, great, great grandson or grandfather is Elia, then the son of Elia was the first Stanley because they saw that Yelnats ba spelled backwards is Stanley, do we understand, okay, and then what does Elia promise to Madame Zeroni? Um, he promised to take Madame Zeroni up to the mountain. He would carry her after he finished taking the pig to Myra to marry Myra. He promised that he would return and take Madame Zeroni up the mountain so he could sing the song to her and she could drink from the water. But as we know, Elia and Myra didn't get married. So what happened now is Madame Zeroni didn't get carried up the mountain because Elia was so upset he got on a boat to America and then he realized when he was in the water, oh my gosh, I forgot to take Madame Zeroni and then he really didn't think they were going to be cursed. Now, are they technically cursed right now and is that what we believe? Yes. So that's why they are cursed is because Elia did not take Madame Zeroni up the mountain like he promised her, okay? And then... um what happens to my when Myra cannot decide who to marry? She does make the people or make the two men, Igor and Elia, decide between a number between one and ten, and they have the one who close guesses the closest number is the one who would she would marry. But Elia didn't choose a number because he was so devastated that she didn't love him originally that he just said, you know what, forget it. I don't even want to marry you. He got upset, and that's when he got on a boat to America. And then that's when he remembered, oh my gosh, I didn't take Madame Zeroni up the mountain. My descendants, descendants, so everyone who's born after me will be cursed for eternity. Okay. And then when Stanley finishes his hole, what does he do? So yes, Stanley gets stuck in his hole, and it is kind of funny. But the biggest thing he did was he was proud of himself, and he did what everybody else did. He turned around, and he spat in his hole, and he walked to camp. Because he was pretty proud of himself, which he should have been, because five feet around and deep is huge. Okay? So today what we're going to do is we're going to read chapters 8 through 11 of holes. Okay? So chapters 8 through 11. All right, I hope you guys are enjoying this. And when it goes back in time, so well, Stanley digging holes and being at Camp Green Lake is the present. Whenever it goes back in time, it's called a flashback. And there's a lot of flashbacks in this story. So when we heard about Elia, that's in the past. It's already happened. That's a flashback, and it's giving us more details about how this story happened and how Stanley got to where he is today. So whenever you hear about something that's not about Stanley or his current family or what's going on in Camp Green Lake, then you know it is a flashback. And I'll try to tell you when I start reading if it's a flashback flashback or not, but kind of just be listening to that because I know it can get confusing, okay? All right, so today is chapters 8 through 11 of Holes. Okay, so last time we left off, Stanley had just finished his first hole at Camp Green Lake, and he had blisters and everything, okay? Chapter 8. A lot of people don't believe in curses. A lot of people don't believe in yellow-spotted lizards, either. 
but if one bites you, it doesn't make a difference whether you believe it or not. Actually, it is kind of odd that scientists name the, the lizard after its yellow spots. Each lizard has exactly 11 yellow spots, but the spots are hard to see on its yellow and green body. The lizard is from 6 to 10 inches long and has big red eyes. In truth, its eyes are yellow, and its skin around the eyes, and it's the skin around the eyes which is red, but everyone always speaks of its red eyes. It has also black teeth and a milky white tongue. Ooh. Looking at one, you would have thought that it should have been named a red-eyed lizard or a black tooth lizard, or perhaps a white tongue lizard. If you've ever been close enough to see the yellow spots, you're probably dead. The yellow spotted lizard likes to live in holes, which offer shade from the sun and protection from predatory birds. Up to 20 lizards may live in a hole. They have strong, powerful legs and can leap out of very deep holes to attack their prey. They eat small animals, insects, certain cactus thorns, and shells of ooh, and shells of sunflower seeds. So I'm assuming there might be some yellow spotted lizards hanging around Camp Green Lake because who eats sunflower seeds? Mr. Sir. So why do you think they are telling us this much detail about yellow spotted lizards? They must play a really important part in this story. So definitely something you want to remember. All right, number, chapter nine, not number nine, I'm sorry, chapter nine. <clears throat> Stanley stood in the shower. So if we're talking about Stanley and he's in the shower, are we in the present or is this a flashback? It's the present, okay? Stanley stood in the shower and let the cold water pour over his hot and sore body. It was four minutes of heaven. For the second day in a row, he didn't use soap. He was too tired. There was no roof over the shower building and the walls were raised up six inches off the ground except in the corners. There was no drain in the floor. The water ran out under the walls and evaporated quickly in the sun. He put on his set of orange clothes. They were clean. He returned to his tent, put his dirty socks in his crate, got, open his, got out his pen and box of stationery, and headed to the rec room. A sign on the door said, Rec Room, spelled W-R-E-C-K, like rec, like you got, your room is wrecked, like it's really dirty. Hmm, I wonder why it's not R-E-C, like recreational room. We'll see. Nearly everything in the room was broken. The TV, the pinball machine, the furniture. Even the people looked broken, with their worn-out bodies sprawled over the various chairs and sofas. X-ray and armpit were playing pool. The surface, of, the surface of the table reminded Stanley of the surface of the lake. It was full of bumps and holes because so many people had carved their initials into the felt. That's what covers the top of pool tables, that green. There is a hole in the far wall and an electric fan had been placed in front of it. Cheap air conditioning. At least the fan worked. As Stanley made his way across the room, he tripped over an outstretched leg. Hey, watch it, said an orange lump on a chair. You watch it, muttered Stanley, too tired to care. What did you say? The lump demanded. Nothing, said Stanley. The lump rose. He was almost as big as Stanley and a lot tougher. You said something, he poked his fat finger in Stanley's neck. What'd you say? A crowd quickly formed around them. Be cool, said X-Ray. He put his hands on Stanley's shoulder. You don't want to mess with the caveman, he warned. The caveman's cool, said Armpit. I'm not looking for any trouble, Stanley said. I'm just tired, that's all. The lump grunted. X-ray and armpit led Stanley over to the couch. Squid slid over to make room as Stanley sat down. Did you see the caveman back there? X-ray asked. Caveman's one tough dude, said Squid, and he lightly punched Stanley's arm. Stanley leaned back against the torn vinyl upholstery. Despite his shower, his body still radiated heat. He wasn't trying to start anything, he said. The last thing he wanted to do after killing himself all day on the lake was get into a fight with a boy called Caveman. 
He was glad X-Ray and Armpit had come to his rescue. Well, how did you like your first hole? asked Squid. Stanley groaned and the others laughed. Well, the first hole, the first hole's the hardest, said Stanley. Hmm, <laughs> no way, said X-Ray. The second hole's a lot harder. You're hurting before you even get it, get started. If you think you're sore now, just wait and see how you feel tomorrow morning, right? That's right, said Squid. Plus, the fun's gone, said X-Ray. The fun? Asked Stanley. Don't lie to me, said X-Ray. I bet you always wanted to big a dig hole, right? I am right. Stanley had never really thought about it before, but he knew better than to tell X-Ray he wasn't right. Every kid in the world wants to dream, wants to big a, wants to dig a great big hole, X-Ray said, to China, right? Right, said Stanley. I mean, said X-Ray, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying, but now the fun's gone, and you still gotta do it again, and again, and again. Can't fun and games, said Stanley. What's in the box? asked Squid. Stanley had forgotten he brought it. Uh, paper. I was gonna write a letter to my mom. Your mother? laughed Squid. She'll worry if I don't. Squid scowled. Stanley looked around the room. This was the one place in camp where the boys could enjoy themselves. And what did they do? They wrecked it. The glass on the TV was smashed as if someone had put his foot through it. Every table and chair seemed to be missing at least one leg. Everything leaned. He waited to write the letter until after Squid had gotten up and joined the game of pool. Dear Mom, Today was my first day at camp, and I've already made some friends. We've been out on the lake all day, I'm so I'm pretty tired. Once I pass the swimming test, I'll get to learn how to water ski. I... He stopped writing as he became aware that somebody was reading over his shoulder. He turned to see Zero, standing behind the couch. I don't want her to worry about me, he explained. Zero said nothing. He just stared at the letter with a serious, almost angry look on his face. Stanley sipped, slipped it back into the stationery box. Did the shoes have red X's on the back? Zero asked him. It took a moment for Stanley to realize that Zero was asking about Clyde Livingston's shoes. Yeah, they did, he said. He wondered how Zero knew that brand. N Zero knew that. Brand X was a popular brand of sneakers. Maybe Clyde Livingston made a commercial for them. Zero stared at him for a moment with some intensity in which he had been, which he had been, with the same intensity in which he had been staring at the letter. Stanley poked his finger through a hole in the vinyl couch and pulled out some of the stuffing. He wasn't aware of what he was doing. Come on, caveman, dinner, asked Armpit. You coming, caveman, asked Squid. Stanley looked around to see that Armpit and Squid were talking to him. Uh, sure, he said. He put the piece of stationery back in the box, then got up and followed the boys out to the tables. The lump wasn't caveman. He was. He shrugged his left shoulder. It was better than being barf bag. Chapter 10 Stanley had no trouble falling asleep, but morning came much too quickly. Every muscle and joint in his body ached as he tried to get out of bed. He didn't think it was possible, but his body hurt more than it had the day before. It was just his arms, backs, and back, but his legs, ankles, and waist also hurt. The only thing that got him out of bed was knowing that every second he wasted meant he was one second closer to the rising sun. He hated the sun. Sorry, let me turn my volume down on my computer really fast. Okay, sorry. He, he could hardly lift his spoon during breakfast, and then he was out on the lake, and then went, and then... I'm sorry. He could hardly lift his spoon during breakfast, and then he was out on the lake. His spoon was replaced by a shovel. He found a crack in the ground and began his second hole. He stepped on the shovel blade and pushed on the very back of the shaft with the base of his thumb. 
This hurt less than trying to hold the shaft with his blistered fingers. As he dug, he was careful to dump the dirt far away from the hole. He needed to save the area around the hole from when his hole was much deeper. He didn't know if he'd ever get that far. X-ray was right. The second hole was the hardest. It would take a miracle. As long as the sun wasn't out yet, he removed his cap and used it to help protect his hands. Once the sun rose, he would have to put it back on his head. His neck and forearms had been badly burned from the day before. He took one shovelful at a time and tried not to think of the awesome task that lay ahead of him. After an hour or two, his sore muscles began to loosen up a bit. He grunted as he tried to stick his shovel into the dirt. His cap slipped from under his fingers and the shovel fell free. He let it lie there. He took a drink from his canteen. He guessed that the water truck should be coming soon, but he didn't finish all the water just in case he was wrong. He'd learned to wait until he saw the truck before drinking the last drop. The sun wasn't even up yet, but its rays darched over the horizon and brought light to the sky. He reached down to pick up his cap, and there next to it, he saw a flat, wide rock. As he put his cap on his head, he continued to look down at the rock. He picked it up. He thought he could see the shape of a fish fossilized in it. He rubbed off some dirt, and the outline of the fish became clearer. The sun peeked over the horizon, and he could see tiny lines where each one of the fish's bones had been. He looked at the bar barren land all around him. True, everyone refers to this area as the lake, but it was, so, it was still hard to believe that this dry wasteland was once full of water. Then he remembered what Mr. Sir and Mr. Pandansky had both said. If he dug up anything interesting, he should report it to one of them. If the warden liked it, he'd get the day off. He looked back down at the fish. He'd found his miracle. He continued to dig, though very slowly, as he waited for the water truck. He didn't want to bring any attention to his find, afraid that one of the other boys might try to take it from him. He tossed the rock face down beside his dirt pile as if it was, had no special value. A short while later, he saw the cloud of dirt heading across the lake. The truck stopped and the boys lined up. They always lined up in the same order. Stanley realized no matter who got there first. X-ray was always in the front of the line. Then came armpit, squid, zigzag, magnet, and zero. Stanley got in line behind zero. He was glad to be at the back so no one would notice the fossil. His pants had very large pockets, but the rock still made a bulge. Mr. Pendansky filled each boy's canteen until Stanley was the only one left. I found something, Stanley said, taking it out of his pocket. Mr. Pendansky reached for Stanley's canteen, but Stanley handed him the rock instead. What's this? It's a fossil, said Stanley. See the fish? Mr. Pendansky looked at it again. See, you can even see all the little bones, said Stanley. Interesting, said Mr. Pendansky. Let me have your canteen. Stanley handed it to him. Mr. Pendansky filled it and then returned it. So do I get the rest of the day off? For what? You know, you said if I found something interesting, the warden would give me the day off. You know, oh, sorry, Mr. Pendansky laughed as he gave the fossil back to Stanley. Sorry, Stanley, the warden isn't interested in fossils. Let me see that, said Magnet, taking the rock from Stanley. Stanley continued to stare at Mr. Pendansky. Hey, Zigzag, dig this rock. Cool, said Zigzag. Stanley saw his fossil being passed around. I don't see nothing, said X-Ray. He took off his glasses wiped down, and wiped them on his dirty clothes and then put them back on. See? Look, it's a little fishy, said Armpit. Chapter 11 Stanley returned to his hole. It wasn't fair. Mr. Pendansky had said, even said his fossil was interesting. He slammed his shovel into the ground and pried open another piece of earth. After a while, he noticed X-Ray had come by and was watching him dig. Hey, caveman, let me talk to you for a second. 
X-Ray said. Stanley put down his shovel and stepped out of his hole. Say, listen, said X-Ray. If you find something else, give it to me, okay? Stanley wasn't sure what to say. X-Ray was clearly the leader of the group, and Stanley didn't want to get on his bad side. You're new here, right? said X-Ray. I've been here for almost a year. I've never found anything. You know, my eyesight's not so good. No one knows this, but you know why my name is X-Ray? Stanley shrugged one shoulder. It's pig Latin for Rex. That's all. I'm too blind to find anything. Stanley tried to remember how pig Latin worked. I mean, X-Ray went on, why should you get the day off when you've only been here a couple of days? If anybody gets a day off, it should be, should be me. That's only fair, right? I guess, Stanley agreed. X-Ray smiled. You're a good guy, caveman. Stanley picked up his shovel. The more he thought about it, the more he was glad that he agreed to let X-Ray have anything he might find. He was going to, if he was going to survive at Camp Green Lake, it was far more important that X-Ray thinks, think he was a good guy than for what, sorry. If he was going to survive at Camp Green Lake, it was far more important that X-Ray think he was a good guy than it was for him to get the day off. Besides, he didn't expect to find anything anyways. There probably wasn't anything of interest out here. And even if there was, he'd never, he'd never been what you would call lucky. He slammed his blade into the ground, then dumped out another shovelful of dirt. It was a little surprising, he thought, that X-Ray was the leader of the group, since he obviously wasn't the biggest or the toughest. In fact, except for Zero, X-Ray was the smallest. Armpit was the biggest. Zigzag may have been taller than Armpit, but it was only because of his neck. Yet Armpit, of all the others, seemed to be willing to do whatever X-Ray asked of them. As Stanley dug up another shovel full of dirt, it occurred to him that Armpit wasn't the biggest. He, the caveman, was bigger. He was glad they called him Caveman. It meant that he actually ex was accepted as a member of the group. He would have been glad even if they had called him Barf Bag. It was really quite remarkable to him. At schools, bully like Derek Dunny used to pick on him. Yet Derek Dunny would have been scared senseless by any of these boys here. As he dug his hole, Stanley thought about what it would be like if Derek Dunny had to fight Armpit or Squid. Derek wouldn't stand a chance. He imagined what it would be like if he became a good became good friends with all of them. And then for some reason, they all went back to him with his to his school. And then Derek Dunny tried to steal his notebook. Just what do you think you're doing? asked Squid as he slammed his hands into Derek Dunny's smug face. Caveman's our friend, said Armpit, grabbing him by the shirt collar. Stanley played the scene over and over again in his mind, each time watching another boy from from Group D beat up Derek Dunny. It helped him dig his hole and ease his own suffering. Whatever pain he felt was being felt ten times worse by Derek. All right, so we'll pick up again with chapter 12. So today we read 8 through 11. All right, now go check your email, listen to this, and answer those questions. You got this. There were no flashbacks during this. This was all present at Camp Green Lake. Proud of you guys. Keep it up. Miss ya.